Well, we are very excited to have Brother Matt with us here this morning to give us words of exhortation a little bit later on. And to introduce his words, uh, he's asked that we read, take a reading from John chapter 3, verse 1 to 21. And I'll ask Brother David uh, to come read that for us. It's now time for us to listen to some words of exhortation in preparation for the emblems before us. And I'll ask Brother Matt. Thank you, Matt. Well, good morning, everyone. It's lovely to be here with you, and thanks for the opportunity to share some thoughts this morning. So this morning, I'd like us to consider Jesus' meeting with Nicodemus. I think this incident in Scripture teaches us a pretty valuable lesson. The lesson is that Jesus meets us where we are, and he challenges us to take a step closer to God. So where we pick up the story, Jesus has just had the first Passover of his ministry. And the religious authorities have had a pretty dramatic introduction to this apparent teacher from Nazareth. He's harshly criticized the money-making practices of the temple, and he's physically driven the merchants out. Uh, For many of the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees, that would have been pretty much the first glimpse they got of Jesus uh, was of him driving people out of the temple. So a pretty intense introduction. He then spent the remainder of the seven day Passover festival teaching and performing miraculous signs in Jerusalem to great public claim. But it seems that Jesus didn't really find what he was looking for in either the people or the religious authorities. Have a look at the end of the previous chapter, John 2, verses. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them, because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man. He himself knew what was in man. I think the language there makes it pretty clear that Jerusalem was entangled in the trappings of mortality. Jesus didn't entrust himself to these people because they weren't of a spiritual mind. And though they were fascinated and intrigued by what he was doing, they didn't yet really understand what he was talking about. They were trapped in mortality, whether that was the mundane cycle of everyday life that in many ways that we can relate to all too well, or whether it was the Jewish religious establishment which existed largely to serve itself. The language there is interesting as well, and it leads us into chapter three. Um, There's actually a a repeated word. Um, That word for man there is the Greek word anthropos. Uh, It says there in verse 25 that Jesus needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. And then chapter 3 goes on, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. So he's kind of tied into that same picture. Nicodemus is here meant to be a spiritual leader, but it seems as though he's suffering from the same spiritual starvation as the rest of the people Jesus didn't entrust himself to. So let's get a bit of an introduction to Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He wasn't, for that reason, directly involved in the operation of the temple, like the Sadducees. So he wouldn't have been necessarily directly offended by Jesus' actions in the temple, but he certainly would have been shocked. And probably having witnessed some of Jesus' miracles in Jerusalem, probably a little intrigued as well by this astonishing person. He was, however, a member of the Sanhedrin which was the most highly respected Jewish council in Israel, selection for which uh, was highly coveted and involved several rounds of promotion. Now, the record doesn't state why Nicodemus came to Jesus by night, but it's entirely possible that he didn't want to endanger his position on the Sanhedrin by publicly associating with this controversial figure. And in this way, Nicodemus, to me, is kind of similar to another figure in Scripture who cut somewhat of a small figure at times in their faith, and that's Gideon. When we first meet Gideon in Judges 6, he's hiding inside a wine press 
so that he doesn't attract the attention of the Midianites. Sort of an unlikely place to find a conquering hero, right? An angel of God appears to him and ironically calls him a mighty man of valor and tells him that he's going to lead Israel. Now Gideon, uh, being a little bit unsure of himself, asks for a sign to give him confidence and the angel provides one. And then, interestingly, rather than telling Gideon at once to go out and conquer the Midianites as, as a result of this sign, the angel gives him sort of a smaller task. He instructs Gideon to go and cut down his father's idols and burn them. Now, I believe this smaller task was designed to build Gideon up and sort of to help him own his calling as a judge of Israel. And interestingly, even when Gideon went to do that, the record tells us that because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. So Gideon started off small, hidden in the night, but God built him up to win great victories for him, and he's listed amongst the faithful who God worked through in Hebrews 11. Now, I believe Nicodemus may have been similar. He came to Jesus by night, and if the words of John 3, verses 19 and 21, the end of the section that Dave read for us today, if those were indeed spoken by Jesus, uh, rather than being an authorial aside from John, they were probably a bit of a challenge for Nicodemus. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. That might have been a little confronting for Nicodemus, who'd come to Jesus by night in the darkness. And we know from the remainder of John's Gospel that, like Gideon, Nicodemus' Nicodemus's faith grew and he did come to the light. In John 7, he stood up for Jesus against his fellow Pharisees, asking, does our Lord judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? And in John 19, he brought ointments and helped Joseph of Arimathea to give Jesus a proper burial. Now at times, we also come to Jesus in the nighttime of our lives. We come to Jesus fearfully, embarrassedly, non-committally, not ready to let go of the comforts and achievements of this life, but irresistibly drawn to this remarkable man who, as Peter says a little later in John, has the words of eternal life. And Jesus is willing to meet us there in the darkness. He, like his father, isn't waiting for perfection before beginning to work with his disciples. But in the same way that Jesus did to Nicodemus, he will challenge us to step out of the comfort of darkness and take the next right action to move closer to the light. I've heard it said that God loves us as we are, and he loves us far too much to leave us that way. Now those words of Peter that I alluded to there, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. They really form a, a powerful contrast to the uncertain approach of Nicodemus. And they kind of lead into the next idea I want to consider, which is the question, who is Jesus to us? Because that's something that Nicodemus had to come to terms with, and it's something that, well, let's see how Nicodemus started out. Have a look at John 3, verse 2. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. It's interesting that Nicodemus very much frames Jesus in terms that would have been familiar to himself as a, as a rabbi and a teacher. He kind of um, stops short of acknowledging what would already be starting to become obvious to people around him, that this man can only be the Messiah. He's able to do these kind of signs, with this kind of authority. I liked what the uh, New English translation notes had to say. It says there, for Nicodemus, all the signs meant is that Jesus was a great teacher sent from God. His approach to Jesus was well-intentioned, but theologically inadequate. 
he'd failed to grasp the messianic implications of the miraculous signs. So Nicodemus speaks of Jesus as a teacher. It's a label that to me suggests that Nicodemus wants Jesus to kind of fit in with his current circumstances. And it's interesting that Jesus uses that same word in verse 10 and kind of throws it back at Nicodemus and says, are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Kind of implies that perhaps Nicodemus wanted Jesus to fit into his picture of things. You know, maybe you're just another really good teacher, maybe even a little higher ranking than me, but a teacher nonetheless. Jesus' response in verse 3 um, at first seems kind of um, completely unconnected, but perhaps is steering Nicodemus in a different direction. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It's interesting that Jesus mentions the kingdom of God there. Um, in fact, in this conversation, uh, with Nicodemus is the only time that phrase appears in the entirety of the Gospel of John, um, the Kingdom of God. So it's clearly being used, you know, for, for some purpose. There's a bit of significance to this. Jesus, I would suggest, is trying to elevate Nicodemus's mind a little bit from the here and now, from just the Sanhedrin and being another teacher to there's actually a coming kingdom. And perhaps the implication here is, and I'm going to be the king. Jesus is directing his mind to the messianic kingdom. And I think we can consider this approach of Nicodemus as a bit of a personal challenge. Because Nicodemus isn't the only one who at times tries to make Jesus fit their current circumstances. We do this as well. Is Jesus for us perhaps kind of just an athlete that we support? The sort of person that, you know, we might follow on social media and, and tune in for their big moments, but they don't actually really impact our day-to-day -day life. Someone that we just support and you know, take some good feeling from at the high moments, but isn't really a consistent feature in our lives. Is he perhaps a dentist that we try to trick? Um, someone that we know that we have to confront every now and then um, for our spiritual health and we might even try to scrub up a little bit for those spiritual occasions, but we know that there's uh, actually a bit of deception, a bit of a facade going on. And once again, he's not really a consistent consideration in our lives. Are we trying to make Jesus fit our current circumstances or are we actually willing to follow him? While we're considering this question of who Jesus is to us, it's pretty clear in this passage that Jesus had a very clear picture of who he was and where he was going. Um, and it was very much uh, looking to the end of his ministry. Um, he was not just trapped in the here and now. In verses 14 and 15, Jesus says there that as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So Jesus there is using the Old Testament that Nicodemus would have been so familiar with to try and give him a hint about what the role of the Messiah is going to be. And he's alluding, of course, to its crucifixion and to the salvation that that will bring. Jesus' allusion to the serpent in the wilderness indicates that he's going to be a personal savior, not just a national one. Um, that was very much the way that the Jews thought about the Messiah at the time, was as a national savior, someone who was going to come and overthrow the Romans. But we know that the serpent on the pole was very much a personal, um, well, savior is not the right word, but a personal means of salvation on, on the behalf of God. Each individual had to look at that serpent on the pole to be cured of their disease. It also suggests that the salvation that Jesus is going to provide is, going, is not going to be based on the law alone. We know that the serpent is not a, a normal feature of the law of Moses. It's not going to be based on the religions that Nicodemus would have been caught up in at the time. So Jesus here is, is trying to steer Nicodemus away from the here and now and to look at things in a higher way, to look at things in a more personal way and to look at the coming kingdom of God. And these are things that we need to challenge ourselves with as well. 
Contrast that with the approach Jesus' own uh, close friends and followers took. Let's have a look at Luke chapter 9. And here again, we have a, a reference to the, the crucifixion. It shows how consistently Jesus uh, thought of this as such a core part of his ministry. In Luke 9 verse 18, Jesus asks the question that we're considering here. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But others say Elijah, and others that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, The Christ of God. And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. So as in John 3, Jesus mentions the crucifixion, which is a key part of his identity and something that Nicodemus probably didn't appreciate until he saw Jesus on the cross at the end of his ministry. We get sort of many little hints and um, sort of suggestions throughout the Gospels that um, the Jews at the time, and certainly the Jewish authorities, didn't really have a proper concept of a suffering Messiah. Um, you know, for those of us now with the, the benefit of hindsight, we can look back into the Old Testament and see that, of course, um, the Messiah had to suffer. But they, they just really didn't get it at the time. And this is something that Nicodemus had to come to terms with. I really think that Jesus' words to Nicodemus are almost a plea to let him into his life. Have a look at verse, come back to John 3 and look at verses 6 and 7 there. Jesus is, is speaking in very absolute terms. He says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Interestingly, that you in that last phrase, you must be born again, is, is plural as opposed, as opposed to singular. Um, it's as if Jesus is not just appealing to Nicodemus, but to all of the Pharisees. And it's a message that we can learn from as well. That which is flesh, that which just comes naturally, that which is, you know, the humanity in us, which, um, you know, was, Jesus didn't entrust himself to at the end of chapter 2, is not going to lead to the kingdom of God. And so Nicodemus needs to make room for Jesus in his life and not just try to fit him to his current circumstances, but actually adjust his own priorities. So let's come to the core of Jesus' message that we read in those verses, being born again. So after Nicodemus's opening pleasantry, in which he approaches Jesus as if he was just another teacher of Jewish law, Jesus responds in an unusual and unexpected way. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, it seems initially like a complete non sequitur. Nicodemus hasn't said anything about being born um, or about the kingdom of God. We've already suggested that by referring to the kingdom of God, maybe Jesus is trying to steer Nicodemus' focus a little bit away from the present to the future. There's another aspect here that needs to be considered. That word born again, the word again, it's an interesting word. Um, the Greek word, which is anothen, can actually mean both again and also from above. Um, and quite a lot of translations make a note of this, um, that it can mean born from above. And I'd suggest that that's probably actually what Jesus means here. Um, the same word is actually used in the same chapter a little bit later on. Look at verse John 3, verse 31. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. So in verse 31 there, um, that from above is that exact same word that's translated again. Uh, in John 3 verse. It's actually used at the other end of Jesus' ministry as well. Have a look at John 19. Uh, and for context, let's go from verse 10. 
John 19, verse 10. So Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greatest sin. So that phrase there, from above, is that same word, anothen, and it's translated as again. If we read Jesus' response to Nicodemus there in that way, I think it actually makes more sense. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus has just said that Jesus is a teacher come from God, from above. So it's almost as if Jesus is agreeing with Nicodemus. Yes, unless I've come from God, I wouldn't be able to do these things and I wouldn't be able to see the kingdom of God, which is where he directs his attention. And it also makes sense in connection to a, a sort of a somewhat difficult comment Jesus makes later on. I think this makes it much easier to understand where he says, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the son of man. That's in verse 13. Jesus has been born from above. He's come from God and he's challenging us to be born from above as well. In the same way that in John 17, Jesus says that he wants to be one with God and he wants us to be one with him and one with God as well. Jesus never claims anything for himself that he doesn't also want for his disciples. I think that's a really important way for us um, as Christadelphians to approach those um, difficult passages um, because these verses, which you know, would often be used um, by people in mainstream churches to you know, try and prove the pre-existence of Christ or the Trinity, are actually Jesus' challenge for us to stop being natural and become spiritual like he is, um, to be born from above like he was, to be one with God like he was, his, I should say. So Nicodemus is kind of taken aback by this. In verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? How can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? I wonder if perhaps this phrase of being born from above is exactly what he'd come to ask Jesus about. It's interesting that when Jesus quotes it again in verse 7, as we said before, he uses the plural you. I wonder if there was maybe an earlier meeting with a group of Pharisees, including Nicodemus, and Jesus had already said this, um, unless, uh, sorry, uh, verse 7, you must be born again or born from above. Regardless, Nicodemus sort of tries to deflect his confusion by asking a bit of an inane question. Um, it's a bit undermining. He either sincerely or facetiously misunderstands Jesus as meaning to literally be born again. So in verse 5, Jesus trying to to Nicodemus. Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Again, I think this makes sense if you interpret Jesus as saying being born from above, because both water and spirit come from above. It's kind of breaking it down into two elements. That word um, spirit, of course, is also um, pneuma, which is the word for wind or breath. So we could interpret it literally as well. And I think by reframing it in this way, Jesus is, is kind of trying to poke Nicodemus a little bit into remembering a couple of things he should know as a Pharisee, as someone who studies the law and the Old Testament. There's multiple passages in the Old Testament about resurrection of Israel leading to the kingdom of God and the involvement of wind and water, this kind of imagery that Jesus is, is provoking here. Let's have a look at a couple of them. Um, Isaiah 44 uses the imagery of water and being born of water. Isaiah 44 and verses 3 to 5 is a prophecy to Israel there. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They shall spring up among the grass like willows by flowing streams. This one will say, I am the Lord's. Another will call the name of Jacob, and another will write on his hand, the Lord's. 
and name himself by the name of Israel. So this would be a passage Nicodemus was familiar with. Um, and there was a lot of um, fascination with these passages of the Old Testament um, at the time of Jesus about the Messiah and about the kingdom of God. Here we have Israel being reborn by water. Have a look at Ezekiel 37, a passage that we often look at about the, the state of Israel. Here we've got being born from wind or breath. Ezekiel 37, verse 9. And he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied, and he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. So here's Israel being born again from the breath. And we know that this is a necessary condition for the kingdom of God to come about. Jesus is trying to prompt Nicodemus to think bigger and in you know, future terms rather than in his immediate context. Have a look at John 3 again. Let's keep stepping through this conversation. So Jesus takes this imagery a step further in verse 6. He says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit or the wind or the breath is spirit. He's implying that humanity and human institutions, such as the Sanhedrin, the flesh, only leads to flesh, only leads to death and corruption. It doesn't lead to the kingdom of God in the way that the spirit does. Only God can make someone fit for the kingdom. It's a real challenge to the thinking of the Pharisees who, um, well, and all of the religious authorities at the time, who'd sort of taken upon themselves the role of being the spiritual leaders of the nation and had kind of, in that way, usurped God's authority. Jesus continues in verse 7, and I think this verse could almost be introduced with a so, because it, I think it's connected directly from what he says in the previous verse. So do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. He's emphasizing the logic and necessity of being born from above. If, if flesh only leads to flesh, well, you have to be born from above. You have to be born by the Spirit. You have to be born from God. That's that same concept that Nicodemus is struggling to understand. It's also interesting when you think about this concept of birth, um, which was so important to the Jews at the time, um, that Jesus is sort of taking away any potential privilege of birth that Nicodemus might have felt that he had. John Carter says about Jesus' response here that Jesus brushed away any supposed privilege of birth. Entrance to the kingdom was not dependent upon natural birth, but upon birth from above. Nicodemus might have been proud of his heritage. He might have come from a, a wealthy or a well-respected spiritual family, but that wasn't going to be enough. He was going to have to have a personal relationship with Jesus and through Jesus with God. The last part of the conversation that I'd like to look at, um, just in the interest of time, is verse 8, which I found very confusing. So this is just my attempt at interpretation. But Jesus says there, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound. But you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. I think Jesus here is basically trying to explain Nicodemus's inability to understand being born from above by indicating that it's beyond ordinary human comprehension. In the same way that Nicodemus isn't able to explain the path of the invisible wind, he's going to have to go beyond the human reasoning that characterizes his conversations in the Sanhedrin, if he wants to understand what it is to be born from above. In the same way, we have to challenge ourselves to break out of the earthly thinking that prevents us from developing a spiritual mind. And we all have this in different ways. I mean, for me, I'm not a member of the Sanhedrin, but I am a teacher. 
And for this restart, term one, and I'm already thinking to myself, it's still 11 weeks and then I get school holidays. Um, and it's, you know, it's very easy for me to, to structure my life in that way. Um, it's very nicely segmented. Um, but that's a very easy way for me to get very caught up in the here and now um, and to be looking very much to, to human solutions to my problems rather than thinking about the coming kingdom of God, which um, may be coming in 11 weeks, may be coming in 11 hours. Um, we don't know. And for that reason, it's very important for us to have that focus, right? We need to challenge ourselves to break out of whatever pattern of thinking is stopping us from thinking about the kingdom and about our king. We all have our own earthly patterns of thought, like Nicodemus, that leave us in need of spiritual rebirth from above. So that in Paul's words, we grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. So now let's come to the emblems. At the other end of Jesus' ministry, he had another meeting by night. This time with a small group of people who openly confessed that he was the Messiah, who had forsaken their old ways and connections and had followed him. Jesus said to his friends, you are those who have stayed with me in my trials. And I assign to you, as my father assigned to me, a kingdom. That you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. This is the same kingdom that he'd spoken of to Nicodemus. And it's a clear sign that Jesus' disciples had been born above, of water and spirit, and that God was preparing them for his kingdom. So as we eat this bread and drink this wine, let's meet our master in our hearts, whether they're filled with darkness or light. Let's contemplate who he is and what he means to us. And let's try to put aside earthly thinking and rise up with our master.